Hello, and welcome to CIF 45 Streams Filmmaker Conversations. I'm Mallory Martin, the Artistic Director for the Cleveland International Film Festival. We want to give special thanks to PNC for sponsoring our Filmmaker Conversations content throughout the festival. On today's special Q&A session, we'll be joined by Nan Fu Wong, the director, producer, and editor of the extremely timely documentary, In the Same Breath. Uh, Nan Fu is an award-winning filmmaker and recent MacArthur Fellow. Uh, this is her fourth feature documentary. Her first two films, uh, Hooligan Sparrow, which was also shortlisted for an Academy Award, and I Am Another You, played at previous SIFs. And her third documentary, One Child Nation, about China's controversial one-child policy, was wildly successful and can still be viewed on Amazon Prime. Nan Fu, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you. Uh, it's a great honor to be back. Uh, so let's get started. Um, before taking a deep dive into your latest film, can you talk a little bit about your background uh, growing up in China, how and when you came to the US and specifically about your time at Ohio University as a fellow Bobcat, I'm especially eager yeah. to hear about that. <laughs> yeah, I, I was born in a small village in China and I spent most all my life in China until I was 26 years old. Um, that was when I decided that I um, wanted to come to the U.S. and I applied to several graduate school. Eventually, I went to Ohio University. I got a full scholarship. So I came uh, not knowing anybody in this country uh, by myself, 26 years old, and starting from scratch. It was, uh, it was a very, I think, interesting period of time because um, Ohio University is in essence, and um, you don't have much to do there except for studying. <laughs> so, so I spent uh, the program there is a master degree in media studies. So I spent a year. Um, it's a one year program, and most of my days and nights are uh, they, they were in the library. Uh, days and nights I would just spend time in the library, but it was at Ohio University where I took my first documentary class. And uh, it was the first time I watched the documentaries. Um, I didn't grow up in a world that there was a lot of media access. Um, I saw fiction films, but never in when I was in China saw documentaries. So there mm -hmm. I was fascinated by this medium uh, that can tell a compelling story just like fiction films do. But at the same time, it's about real people and could have the impact on our society, our lives. So that was when I decided I this is what I wanted to do um, at that time. That's great. And when so what what year was that that you were? 2011. 2011. Okay. Yeah, yeah it's almost 10 years now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so there's been just a few documentaries out so far uh, this year, specifically about Wuhan. Um, most notably, 76 Days, which was also just recently shortlisted for uh, the upcoming Oscars. I've seen three of them uh, this year so far, including yours. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, In the Same Breath is by far the most informative um, about what really happened there in 2020, yet yeah, also empathetic uh, towards the citizens of Wuhan and especially the healthcare workers. Can you talk a little bit about how this documentary manifested from the beginning? What kind of film did you want this to be? And you have a background in journalism as well, so how did that kind of lead to the outcome of the film? The film really started because um, in January, I um, had took my son to China and I left my son with my family. Uh, so I came back to the US for work. And the day that I came back to the US was January 23rd, the lockdown started in Wuhan. So I landed in San Francisco and I learned the news that Wuhan was locking down. My family lived uh, 200 miles away from Wuhan. So the first initial stage uh, for me, it was reacting to it, trying to figure out what happened, how serious the virus was, whether I need to go pick up my son or whether my family was safe. So I was reading through all the news, all the social media posts and uh, trying to talk to people who were inside Wuhan. And the more I learned, the more I realized there is a huge discrepancy between what the government was presenting about the virus to the world and to its people uh, versus what is truly happening in on the ground in reality. And mm -hmm. when I saw this, 
and also because of my previous work, which I knew that censorship, surveillance, and covering up corruption, all of those I was familiar with in with the mm -hmm. Chinese government. And I felt the urgency of telling the story at that moment. But at the time, I thought it was a story about China's uh, handling, mishandling of the virus. Um, mm -hmm. And I didn't realize until late March, um, I think when all the people realized how when it reached the US and how bad it was. It was shocking to me. At the time, I didn't even think that the US would be part of the story because naively I thought the outbreak would never reach the US or even if it came here, it was like a case here, a case there, and so they would be able to stop it. And, um, and when it didn't happen, um, I confronted myself about my own biases why would i think that us would be able hand, to handle that and, mm -hmm. and why it didn't happen so that became a major part of the film as well yeah okay so so did you entirely direct the film from the us okay yes, so that, that's what i gathered room. from yeah, from the room? Film from this room, this specific room, edited in this room, like there, I have that, like my laptop, uh, my computer is editing there. So this is my home office. This film was entirely directed remotely and it's the largest, I would say, uh, scale of collaborators that I've ever had on a, on a project. Um, all our main producers are based in the US um, We have, um, for other producers, um, Jal and Julie, Carolyn and Chris. And, but we have at least 10 cinematographers in China on the ground filming and uh, several other field producers, research and assistants, archival researchers. Mm -hmm. is, and then we have 10 cinematographers in the US in different states filming. And we have field producers in the US as well. And they, they are not, the the team the crew each time when they film something the most on the ground would be two people like i don't think we have maybe the most is three usually it's one man band one woman band and then two people and then three the most so all this like 10 cinematographers in the us and in china they each are filming uh in the us for example uh they are la we have a team uh, North Carolina, we have a team. Michigan, we have a team. And in China, they are all in Wuhan, but they are divided into different territories. So there is one small team, one cinematographer. He's he's exclusively filming inside uh, the first re responders ambulance, following them. Another is inside a hospital. Another is just filming with um, residents who are in quarantine and another one film. So we're kind of like divided. Each one has their own uh, territory storyline. Um, but yeah, the directing all, I would zoom in and FaceTime and do the interviews from here uh, with an, anybody around. So all the interviews that you saw were done through FaceTime or Zoom or a video chatting um, that I'm here doing like this with you. I mean, that's, it's just remarkable. And I have so many follow up questions to that. But I think the first one, I mean, it sounds like you just built a massive network of cinematographers and producers. And, and that's, that's really the only way you could uh, make this film during this time. So one, my, my first question is how, how did that start? How did, I mean, were these people that you had worked with before or was it something that you specifically targeted cinematographers that you knew were in these areas? Um, and my second part to that question is, is you also had to worry about people getting sick uh, yeah. during this time too. So how did that affect your production? Yeah. It's a gradual process of accumulating more collaborators and uh, getting uh, connected with more people. But it starts with me and uh, our producers in the US, Jialin, who is also a Chinese citizen. And we have a few um, assistants who are Chinese, but in, the, in New York. And so the first step is reaching out to people among our um, personal contacts, co personal connection, because we couldn't really advertise or publicize our hiring like on social media right. because the government if we don't want the government to see anything and uh, right. immediately shut down the production 
So we can only through trusted uh, personal connection and ask one person, one person puts in touch with another person. So gradually mm -hmm. we found a couple of them like who are in the in Wuhan and have access to film. And then um, and then we continue that process of getting to connect it to with more people. So that that team grew. So we have like mm. three people, then four, then six, and then ten. And some of them I've never met or worked with. Some of them were people that I fully trusted who worked with me in the past, who um, um, just like I, I know. And we kind of like also task in them depending on how much trust we have or what we know about what their work too, how comfortable mm. they are with sensitive subject. So in this film, there were people who were sensitive. The things that they talk about, um, if normal, ordinary people go in there, they might, some people are very patriotic, that they might be shocked, mm. like, oh my God, this is critical. And they might go report to the government. So we had to anticipate and make the decision of who goes where and who knows what kind of information. And in the US is similar. I think some of the cinematographers I've worked with and knew and immediately I was like, okay, Michigan, I know who is in Michigan or LA, mm. I don't know anybody. Like let's find a new person mm. by word of mouth, reputation, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and for, for as far as interviewing people through a computer, screen um, as a director and someone who's interviewed people mostly, I assume, in person in the past, what was that like for you? Was it a challenge? Uh, if the internet connection is all good, actually it yeah. doesn't feel like a challenge. It, mm. it became a challenge when it froze, when it was like when at some point it froze <laughs> or it went in black or a blank, the person, the other person can't see the reaction. It would right. be a challenge or the because I remember like there were one interview uh, with a clinic owner, the woman, uh, Chen, and the first 10 or 15 minutes of conversation during the interview, I feel like she wasn't engaging with me. Uh, even through this computer, I think screen, you can feel that somebody's engaging and making eye contact. So I feel like the first 10 minutes she wasn't engaging. She was just like, her eyes is looking down and mm. she's not really, making connection with me. And I was like, oh, this is gonna suffer because if I don't feel that connection, it's hard. And then mm -hmm. we paused and turns out the FaceTime, the laptop that sat next to the camera was off. Like the screen <laughs> server was off at some point, like two minutes. So she's, she's complete, she didn't hear my voice. <laughs> so right. we identify that, fix it that, and then the rest of it is completely fine. It actually doesn't feel like we are in two different countries and uh, two different mm -hmm. worlds. I think if the audio and the visual is connecting well, um, it works just like we are in person there. That's fascinating. I feel like that could maybe open up more doors in the future for yeah. documentary filmmaking too, if you can't get to a part of the world. Yeah, interesting. Um, so obviously there's an extreme concern about government surveillance in China, uh, specifically for anyone that didn't go along with the positive narrative. Um, are you able to talk at all about your current relationship with your home country? Are you still able to go back, see your mother? How is your mother doing? Um, I don't know about like going back and uh, so each time when I make a film that's critical about China, whether it's a hooligan spare or one child nation mm -hmm. or this film, um, the, the question is always unknown how the government mm. would react to it. And even when I was making it, I would guess or discuss with my close like family, my husband and my family. How do you think the government would react? Is this worse a problem than one child nation for them? Or is this like, you know, I, right. I don't know. And I think with, uh, with the government, so oftentimes they don't, they they don't do things. So, uh, according to the law or it's so arbitrary like every decision mm -hmm. they make who to arrest and to how many years they are sentenced for a lot of the activists even some of them in the film is complete arbitrary so mm -hmm. the question is what's going to happen to me or my family is always a gamble i think mm -hmm. um each time after the film was released, I would try to go back and see, okay, is somebody gonna show up at the airport? Okay, no, is somebody gonna show up at my home? No, like let's take a step by step and see. And then if I go in and out and without them, okay, fine, maybe they didn't 
think that this is a huge uh, issue or or they, they all they wanted to do is to censor the information, which has been the case with every film. There is no mentioning, there is no review, no uh, post that can exist on the internet in China. Um, everything would be deleted right away. And so was with this film. And I can see sometimes depending on how fast they acted, like two days after the film was out, the information deleted or one day, then I could gauge a little bit of how serious they've been seeing about the work. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And and so how is your mother doing? Would she is she doing okay? And right now she's fine. Yeah. We Good. nobody in this film have been contacted uh, because of the film yet. Great. Okay, that's good to know. And you mentioned the the journalists that you talk about in the film too, and how some of them did disappear, and specifically Chen, who disappeared yeah. um, February sixth. Do you is there an update about any of them? Do you know their current status, he, or are these? He's, he's believed to be um, put under house arrest even until today, and nobody had contact with him. But uh, it okay. seems like he's back, like in the place, not in jail. Um, okay. But the the one person that is in the sequence where you saw the activist that got disappeared, she was recently mm -hmm. on December twenty eighth sentenced to four years, and she's wow. going through a hunger strike right now in in prison. Um, yeah. Wow. Um, okay. So, and though you know we're we're not necessarily as censored here in the states, the parallels that you make between the government secrecy uh, in both countries is of course appropriate, um, yet still pretty astounding. Um, even though a reminder that at one point Dr. Fauci was telling us not to wear masks, um, you know, was frustrating uh, to say the least. Um, towards the end of the film, you make a comparison and state um, that in cases like this, ordinary people become casualties of their leader's pursuit of power. I loved that line. Um, in your opinion, it's kind of a loaded question, but in your opinion, how can we as citizens avoid this in the future you know if if another virus shows up for example or or you know education is a big part of it but is there anything else along the way that you realized um is important for us as citizens to to do that's a great question i think um what i was hoping to do with this film is to for it to serve as a reminder i think once the uh, once people get vaccinated or if it gets into the summer and if this is uh, over, which we all look forward to, but mm -hmm. it's also easy for people to forget. People wanted to forget and um, easy for them to forget and not holding, you know, the, the people, the authority accountable. And I think mm -hmm. if we're not examining closely and uh, raising questions and asking them for accountability and answers, um, the, the pro some of the early issues is the government hasn't been transparent and or intentionally um, mislead people. Mm -hmm. And I think if some of those issues were not acknowledged, held accountable, then it will, it will repeat uh, if it's not yeah. another pandemic or something else. How, if the trust has been breached, how can you rebuild that trust again? Um, and a lot of the issues that have been ex exposed uh, during this pandemic, they don't only exist during the pandemic, during 2020, it was issues mm. that were there prior to 2020 and will exist long after 2021. So I think mm. it's, um, it, it, we would need to remember like those issues were not just the virus and that's the the goal i think uh, ultimately i was making this film not it, it's not a film about covid or about the virus it's more political than the virus itself it's about all the political issues um problems that exist in our societies in both the systems Right. And I love that you just brought up trust because I think that's such a important part. And at least in the United States, I think um, I think the average citizen would um, and very much so at the beginning, you know, trust whatever the CDC is telling them. And I think all of us were, were scrambling to find yeah. what to listen to and, and, yeah. and what guidance to to follow. Um, and I think uh, we've learned more than anything this last year that our, you know, our government is 
um, you know, not invincible in that way either in that, that we do need to make sure that we're questioning things and we're, we're studying things and as in the know as we possibly can be. So thank you for making that point. Um, the parts of the film in which you interview healthcare workers, both in China and in the U.S., were particularly moving. Um, I think that was the biggest contrast in terms of U.S. nurses being able to speak out while Chinese hospital workers appear to be quite silenced, um, yet you could still see how much trauma they were holding in. And I think one of the nurses um, in the U.S., I think it was, uh, makes a point that you know, when healthcare workers around the world can finally stop and take a breath, um, you know, that's when all the trauma that they experience will really sink in. And I think you're seeing as at least in America, we're getting closer to that horizon with mass vaccination. I just got my shot a few days ago. Um, do you think as a society, we're now headed toward a moment of PTSD, especially for healthcare workers? Yes, I think PTSD for the families who lost the family members as well. Um, mm -hmm. And the healthcare workers definitely, I think China lifted this uh, lockdown in Wuhan in April, but in July, in September, in November, like every time when I talk to healthcare workers or victims of families, and even a year later, like this year, right now, March, um, which a lot of people passed away last year around this mm. time. They mm -hmm. still suffering the PTSD, and I don't think there is a channel yet that uh, is fully established how to how to help them uh, get through this. Um, mm. And then I think I I have a lot more contact with people who experience the PTSD in China, and I think it's a different. Maybe it's not or at least for now that they were saying for people, I remember like the the main, one of the characters in our film, she was saying her family died, but they couldn't get a bed in the hospital. They couldn't register on um, the death toll of uh, the COVID death. Um, so from the moment when they were seeking for help till the moment that they had died, the country did not acknowledge this person exists, did not like, mm did not give help and did not consider this person as a COVID death or it's like to the government, some of the individuals never existed. And they, and then I think uh, for a lot of families, they felt that way. Um, who do they hold accountable for the death that it was, could be avoided? Mm. Um, and then for the healthcare workers, I'm sure it's similar you could celebrate them which is fine like totally fine but what does it do when you how much it actually helps when you are simply um talking about the slogans of the heroes and uh, celebration in a very superficial level right yeah right and it's almost like um you know, a, a physical health problem is is now very much morphing into a mental health problem um, all over the world. And um, I love that you brought up um, the families too, and who are they holding accountable and how many are holding themselves accountable? I mean, even, I'll never forget um, the scene specifically um, with the ambulance and, and the two men and having yeah. to make a decision about leaving. I, I don't know if it's their grandmother or mother, um, you know, do they leave her at the hospital or do they take her back home knowing that they can't give her care? And how do you make a decision like yes. that ever, let alone in that moment when you're suffering so much already? So, um, yeah, that's yeah. one thing I wanted to say, like that struck me. And uh, when I was talking to people is they we all have guilt when we experience uh, a sudden loss of a beloved person. And this mm -hmm. um, exists even more so among the COVID deaths family uh, members because they constantly question themselves, should I have done something differently? Should I have called the ambulance earlier? Or should I have like sent um, my mom, my dad to the hospital, the first sign of a code? Or should I have like stopped him or her from going out that day to grocery shopping? So like I, I saw them all question themselves. And so when I try to remind them, it's not your fault. Like all of this is not your fault. But I think people who are suffering from PTSD didn't get that. They constantly think, what could I do differently when it's the government should have asked themselves that question. Right, right. Um, 
Okay, uh, so let's talk about the ending of the film. Um, I loved how you framed it as a sort of what if finale um, with the Mac News reports. Um, did you know from the beginning that's how you wanted to close out the film? I always knew at the end, um, that's the theme, that's the question I want to leave to end, um, which is mm -hmm. an open question, which is also, it does not end when the pandemic is over. It's, um, it's always something that makes me more concerned about where is the direction that our world is going after the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the issues continued and um, uh, especially like if we are, um, the world is now shifting in the way that people are praising China. And uh, I think the geopolitical um, picture is going to change after post-COVID era, you would say. Um, mm. And that's always my concern and always the way I wanted to end the film and how to do that, whether to use the news clip or like what image, what audio and how to convey that visually. Um, it, it was a challenge. It was a trial and error, many, many different versions. But the mm. same theme was always um, the idea. Same. Yeah. No, I, I just I, I love that that's the way you ended the film. It was so haunting and I, I think also um, I think that's what will stick in viewers minds more than anything and I think that's a really important thing for us to remember and, and question moving forward um, so thank you for that um, so lastly as a Chinese born American can you reflect a little bit on what's happening currently in the states in terms of protests against Asian American discrimination and hate crimes um, especially within the past year with some Americans believing China is to blame for the COVID-19 pandemic um, just would love to hear your thoughts about that yeah I think um, the mishandling of the pandemic um, is is in every like there are so many ways that we can see the consequences. We are still living through the consequences every day. And I think mm -hmm. the hate crime that the recent outbreak of the hate crimes against Asians and Asian Americans is one particular uh, painful consequence um, because of the former president have popularized the term China virus when it, it, it is the, corona, the coronavirus that uh, reached the entire world, a pandemic, and has nothing to do with, uh, shouldn't be given a name just because it started in China. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I think that's one example of how the damage is so um, deep and white that it would take a long, long time, I think, um, for for this country, for people to recognize the damage and to correct it, the, the path that is has taken. And I'm hoping that first by acknowledging these consequences and recognizing what had caused them, what kind of be behavior and action that caused them, that would be the first step of um, leading to change. Mm. Yes, thank you. Um, so I, you know, coming off of um, such a year um, and the fact that you were able to make this film um, during such a trying year, um, you know, this might be um, uh, another loaded question, but what what might be next for you? Do you know yet? Is there um, or is there another film in your in your mind that you want to start on? Yeah, I always. Uh... Yeah, I always have, I am already working on new projects, um, but couldn't talk much about it. But yeah, I'm Great. in production um, on new projects already. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay, well, hopefully um, we can bring those future projects back to SIF and hopefully we can actually bring you to Cleveland in person one day. Yes, yeah. um, so that we can meet in person. That would that would be lovely. Yeah. So thank, thank you, you so much again, Nanfu, for spending your time with us today. Thank you for sharing your film with our audience. Thank you. Thank you. I want to also thank you, our audience, for joining us for today's Q&A session. Uh, we wouldn't be here without you and your ongoing support to bring film home. Please consider supporting our challenge match presented by Cuyahoga Arts and Culture to support the future of our festival. Our goal is to reach $145,000 this year, and we're so grateful for any amount that you're able to contribute. To donate, purchase tickets, or check out our full schedule schedule of filmmaker conversations like this one, uh, please visit clevelandfilm.org. With that, please stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you next time.